Uh, welcome. I am honored to have here with me today Len Tours, resident of Fairhaven, uh, true sailor, true old salt, <laughs> as I like to call him, um, here to present to us and, and share with us his stories, his sea stories of his time uh, in the New Bedford fishing fleet. So, Len, I'll g yeah. let you just get started. and. Um, All right. I'll start off by giving you a little rundown of my childhood. My grandmother brought me up. I lived with her, and she had about six grandchildren, but I was her favorite because she didn't speak English. Okay. So that's how I learned how to speak Polish. And I, naturally, I was her favorite because I could speak Polish. Now. She was a tough old woman, I'll tell you. I don't know how the hell she did it. She worked hard she, right up until her last days. She must have been in her 90s. But uh, I was the only grandchild she depended on. She, had to, she was an alien. She never became a citizen. Okay. So every year I used to take her down to the post office in New Bedford and... She had to register as an alien. They, that was on a yearly basis they had to do that. But she was as much of a good person in America as she was in Poland. So anyway, as, <clears throat> I met a, quite a few friends. One of my friends got me introduced to the work and waterfront. And his father had just had a brand new boat built. It was a beautiful vessel. So they just happened to be in this particular day, and they had 60 or 70,000 pounds of fish. At that time, there was a lot of fish around. Yeah. So he said, come on, let's get down on the boat. He said, maybe we'll get a job doing something. So we went down there, but because of their union rules, a lot of the guys that worked on the boats, they didn't want us working. But anyway, we got jobs running errands for the crew, going to the laundry and stuff like that. Uh, she was in New Bedford that day on her maiden voyage with, like I say, 60 or 70,000 pounds of fish. And so the crew would give you a few dollars, you know, for running the errands. And that's how I got more or less around the docks in New Bedford. And uh, once in a while we, we would get a job on, on a boat if they were shorthanded for the regular guys. But after a while, my father, my stepfather, he got a job on this particular boat. And this summer day, he said, hey, if you want to go fishing, he said, I can get you on the boat. So I wasn't doing anything anyway. I said, yeah, okay, let's go. So I went out on that boat. The name of the boat was the Marmax. M-A-R-M-A-X. And the skipper was a, I think he was a psychopath. <laughs> I really do because he was a mean son of a gun. But anyway, I was a rookie. I stayed on that boat probably for about six or eight months. After a while, I got to learn the business, and I got pretty good at it. So, I'll tell you a few stories about the boat. One of the things was this, the skipper was a drinker. Mm -hmm. So on this particular trip, we left New Bedford, and, uh, we went from New Bedford to Woods Hole. So I wasn't old enough to drink anyway. But them guys, they went up to bar room, started drinking, and my friend and myself, we went to a movie. So when we came out of the movie, we could see a state trooper leading the crew out of the bar room. <laughs> Something happened. So he called a cab for the guys. So we all drove down to Woods Old Wharf 
and he says, get the hell out of here. We don't yep. want you here at all. So we got on the boat. We went from Woods Hole to Martha's Vineyard. Now that was probably a half hour ride. So we got to Martha's Vineyard and the skipper and the mate, they went up the street and uh, we left to our own demise. Well, this guy from Texas that was on a boat, as soon as the skipper went up the street, he started packing his bag. He wasn't going to stay there. So he's got his bag all packed. He gets up, he gets his bag up on a dock. Here comes the skipper and the mate. So the skipper says, where the hell are you going, Tex? He said, Jimmy, I gotta go. I'll tell you, I gotta go. I can't stay here. He said, put your bag back on the boat. So he, there was a lot of fussing back and forth, but he eventually put his bag back on the boat. Well, we left Martha's Vineyard, went to Nantucket. Now, from what I am, I was starting to think, I guess this is going to be like a tour of the islands. So, during the day we had something to eat on the boat. Then them guys went up the dock to have a few drinks. Well, man, I was ripping. I said, what the hell's going on? We're going to be doing this all, you know, for a week or so. So, that night, it started to snow. And the skipper and most of the guys were up on the dock, up at the uh, bar room. And uh, I figured, what can I do to get back at this sucker for doing this? So I got a couple of rocks. I was going to break the pilot house windows. Because <laughs> if we were going to go out fishing and snowing and cold, he wouldn't have time to have them fixed. But anyway, just as about to throw my first rock, there comes a couple of the guys from the boat down the dock. So I didn't do that, figuring, you know, better not do it. Well, then I started figuring, what was I going to do? Well, I went in his cabin. He had a cabin where he slept. Him and my father, my stepfather, they, they were in the same cabin, but I didn't want to turn any lights on because I figured somebody would notice them. So anyway, I, I reached down on the floor, and he wore these special kind of boots, yep. the skipper. So I take him, I open the door, I threw one over. I threw another one over. So anyway, they... Finally, after that there, when they finally did get back down the boat, they, they decided they're going to have something to eat. So they had the, the fire going on, the, the stove was hot as hell. So he got some sausages out of the fridge. No frying pan, he just put them right on top of the yep. stove. Well, before you know it, with all that grease, there was a big freaking <laughs> flame you know, anyway, they finally doused the fire, and after that, he, he gets the boat going, starts the engine, we're off. I'm saying, good, we're going out fishing, finally. Yep. Where is he headed? Provincetown. Well, at that time in Provincetown, they they were getting these small scallops, so that, I guess he got word of that. And he was going to go down there, so we went, they usually bring him ashore in a shell. So we went heading down there. It was rough as a son of a gun. So some guy that he hired from Nantucket was on the boat. He was down forward. And with them guys frying all that greasy stuff, the deck in a forecastle was all slippery with grease in it. So this guy here from Nantucket, he decides as we're going, we're bouncing up and down, and uh, the ladder was greasy also. 
he falls off the ladder coming up out of forecastle. So he's laying, <laughs> he's laying on his back in a, in a forecastle. I was up in a bunk, and my father was down there, and I could hear him say, "Are you all right, Ernie? Are you all right, Ernie?" So I look over, and Ernie's laying down on the deck. My father's got his mic because the guy had a hearing aid. He's got it. <laughs> Are you all right, Ernie? Are you all right? Almost blew his head off. But anyway, uh, the guy was in tough shape. So we get to P-Town. They had to call an ambulance to get him off the boat. So the Coast Guard made that arrangement. And, uh, of course, the tide is so different down there. Low tide is low tide. Yeah. So, well, anyway, we got him off the boat, and we went out fishing. So what you would do, you'd make a tow, and you'd put the, the scallops, dump them on deck, and then you'd fill up these burlap bags with scallops. So you could do that for days at a time. So we, we did that overnight. I don't know how many bags of scallops we had. So the idea was, we come into the dock, they had a truck there, you bring us, he hoist the scallops up, and uh, that, we, we, we thought we were ready to go out again. But in the meantime, the mate and the skipper go up the dock. So we figure they're going to be drinking, and it's going to be the same old so this friend of mine is Donald Walt. We said, we're not what the hell with this. We're going to try to get back to New Bedford. So we went up the dock, and just as we got around the corner, here's the skipper and the mate come. They didn't see us. So there was a truck from New Bedford, a fish carrying, uh, picking up fish down P Town. So. We asked them if they could take us back to New Bedford. They already yep. did. We were going 21 days from New Bedford, and I didn't make a dime. And uh, I don't know about the other guys. But anyway, that was like some of my first experiences. But I mean, I was only a kid then, and I guess they figured and do what the hell they want with you when you're young like that. But I stayed on a boat to get the experience. And uh, one of the experiences was we were headed out on that same boat to my max. And, we're he and it was a cold snow night. And I, the skipper told, I was on wheel watch with this other guy. So the skipper tells the other guy the light was out, the mass headlight. Mm -hmm. You gotta go up and change the bow. And he's saying, Jimmy, I, 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 I don't like height, I can't go up. He says, get up there, you can do it. So the guy goes up forward, he, he climbs up a couple of ratlins, that's as far as he wants to go. <laughs> so, I, you know, of course the boat's going back and forth, so I said, Jim, I said, I'll go up. He said, no, no, don't worry about that. He said, there's nothing wrong with that light. I just turned the switch off. So, you know, well, that's the way he was. <laughs> but anyway, they, we, I, I don't know if I went up and changed it, but it got changed anyway. It didn't need to change it, that's what it was. So we headed out late and it was thick, thicker fog. You couldn't see. 20 feet and at that time we didn't have radar yeah yeah so we're going along going along all of a sudden boom bang crash and this boat i was on had a steel bow well what happened was we hit a liner a dutch liner she was going like that and we plowed into her and as she kept going it was like shearing the top of the bow right off Ugh. Because our bow was metal. Well, anyway, when that happened, the, the boat went down, the water come pouring in, and we we all managed to kill each other 
trying to get up the ladder to get out of there, which we did. So we get up on deck. Now, maybe half hour, an hour later, the fog lifts a little bit so you can see you halfway. You look at that ship, it looks like a mountain. But anyway, we uh, they sent over a launch and the the guy there were about six guys in there. So they came alongside and uh, they said, you know, if you guys it's a good idea for you to get off the vessel if you're in danger and we'll take you into New York. We gotta get that good New York. So he said, We're on a tight schedule. So Fish Mary's husband, he was one of the crew members, but he had put on all his oil clothes, his southwest, you know. Mm -hmm. He looked like the Gloucester <laughs> model. Yeah, yeah. But he was a comical guy. But uh, he said, uh, people, you could see the people up on deck. They were all trying to take pictures of us. And so he said, I, we can't stay forever. We're on a tight schedule. So he headed for New York. Well, we shoveled all the, we had about 30 ton of ice in a fish hole. So we shoveled all that out and brought the bow up. But it, and it was flat top. And, uh, well, we got back to New Bedford. And then she had to go in the shipyard for about a month mm -hmm. with, for repairs. So you were under 18 when all this was happening. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that I must, mean, that, that must have been a hoot, though. It was in those times. Yeah, yeah. You know, I only weighed 130 pounds, for Christ's sake. But uh, after that, I got, got so that I was on different boats. I, I got more experience, you know. Uh, and then there was another time I was on this boat and uh, the engine broke down. And we were about 200 miles offshore. So we called the Coast Guard and the uh, a Kushnet, which was a buoy tender, okay. big, big iron vessel. And they never usually sent a big, but I guess she was in the area at that time. So they, they, they came to our aid, so my friend and Billy that was on a boat, we were standing up on the hatch waiting for when the Coast Guard throws a line. So the Coast Guard comes around the boat this way here, like this, and he's, he's like jogging up closer, and he's gonna throw that monkey's fist to us, you mm -hmm. know? So we're standing on the hatch waiting, and I'm saying, Jesus Christ, Bill, this guy's getting closer and closer. He was, you know. All of a sudden, I don't know if there was something wrong with the the throttle or whatever. Bang, he smashes right into a <laughs> starboard side. And, I mean, he broke a couple of ribs and a couple of planks. So, well, they ended up towing us as far as uh, Great Round Shoals right off Chatham. And... Uh, a smaller Coast Guard boat brought us in. Mm. So that was some of my earliest experiences. But the like scallops at that time went was forty six cents a pound. So, you know, I was still for my young age the money was all right. Mm -hmm. But uh after a while, one of the uh, buyers for the scallops, he said, uh, you know what, by the time you guys get in next time, you're lucky if the price is 40 cents. Mm. <clears throat> so I figured the hell with a scallop and I'm gonna go dragging. Mm -hmm. So fishing was a click. You know, if you happen to know guys, like any other lot of the jobs, but uh, I did get a job on a dragon. I, I was on that dragon for eight years after that. Mm. Of course, they built a new they built a new boat. Now here's a, 
funny story, I think. The, the, you know what a whale back is on a boat? Where you stow gear up forward? Okay. It's on the same level as the, the deck you're working on, but it had a covering on it. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's what we used to stow all our gear and everything. Well, this particular time, one of these shore birds, and we used to get a lot of birds come off shore. Yeah. Get blown off or whatever. So this bird, he was he had a beak on him like that. So he landed on our boat and right near the whale back. And any time the guys went up to get some gear or something, he'd start flapping his wing and making all kind of noises, <laughs> clicking his beak. So they were afraid to go up there. Yeah. So I said, I'll go up there. I went up there, I grabbed him by the freaking neck and I threw him under the whale back. <laughs> and uh, when I, then I went under the whale back and we had this two bushel basket there. So I grabbed the bird, threw him under the basket, put the basket down. So that was his prison for a while. So after a few days, I said, geez, that bird must be hungry. Mm -hmm. Now the guys are down below eating breakfast, so <coughs> I went up there and I wet some bread and I get that bird by the neck, put it up between my leg and I got him like this and I open his mouth and I'm shoving that wet bread down his throat. He escapes from my leg and flies on his uh, hatch that we had that in it. You look down to the table where the guys are eating. So all of a sudden the bird just blah, blah. All of a sudden, all the bread comes up, pop, pop, pop. <laughs> Man, those guys were pissed off. So uh, a couple of days later, he was still there. So we had, uh, I had hard boiled eggs for breakfast there. And I got some of this gravy master and I spotted all the eggs, mm -hmm. and I took them and I threw them under the, the basket. So the guys come up on deck, all of a sudden one guy, Jesus Christ, the bird laid an egg! The bird, he got all freaked out. So, so that was one of the funny things. You know, you try to humor yourself out there after a while. Another time, we this I don't know what I was scalloping then, but we were ready to go out and we were short-handed a man, and uh, this guy he used to be fishing, but he was from California, so he wanted to make a trip. So the skipper hired him. He goes up by, buys all brand new gear, boots and. A, so we're he we head out. Now it was in January, and uh, we get out to the fishing ground, we make a couple of toes, so we got scallops loaded on mm -hmm. deck. Well, nobody was paying attention, least of all him, because he, he was the one that was supposed to know about it. But the wire that was holding the drag attached to the winch, mm -hmm. So the, we're going to set out. They ring the bell for the set out. He doesn't realize about that wire being under the scallops that had been piled on deck. Well, when that drag went out, the weight of the drag snapped that wire up. It was right underneath his feet and flipped him overboard. Jeez. And it was snowing like hell at the time, too. And... Uh, the skipper lost it. I mean, he he didn't know what the hell to do. So everybody's telling him, you know, turn around, go see it, go see if we can. So we find there that guy. You could see him in the water. Put the spotlight on him, and we got him alongside the boat. Well, we had the drags were still hanging down from the galley. So we come alongside, and we we get him. We can't reach him because of the rail was so high that we we, we kind of guided him up to where the drags were hanging from the galley. So he grabs a wire and 
but we couldn't reach down far enough to get a, get a hold of them. So I said, why don't we put them in a basket? So that's what we did. We lowered the basket down. He got in the basket, but every time we tried to come up with a basket, he wouldn't let go of that wire. So it, it tipped the basket over. So I said, I'll go, me, me, 130 pounds. I, I, I jump down there and see what I can do to tie a line around him or something. So I, I, I got this line around him and the same thing happened. When they tried to bring up the basket, he wouldn't let go of the wire. And it, the basket started a tip and by this time, I'm tired, and I, you know that what I make tired some quick. So, and it was freezing. So anyway, I said, I don't know if he wants to come out or get me the hell out of here. So when they did, the line, I guess, was tied around him. They, they finally got him up where they could reach him by his hand. Now that's the first time and I just realized this not too many years ago, that I, I had hypothermia, so did he. Yeah. So we're, we went down forward, we changed our clothes, we put our blankets around, stand in front of the stove, and I mean, we were chattering away. We just couldn't stop. Yeah. But after a while, I think, once our blood got warmed up or whatever. So let's see. So when did you decide that you wanted to do this full time for work. Was it immediately when you first went out? No, not really. Did it take a little while to get kind of used to it? And well, I mean, I I think I like the challenge. Yeah. You know what I mean? Make you feel like oh, a macho guy, a <laughs> fisherman, you know. But I was married, and I had four kids, and my wife was always after me to quit fishing. Mm -hmm. So uh, that Chamberlain Manufacturing opened up up there in the North End. And uh, I said, uh, I'm gonna see if I can get it. I got in there, start me off at $1.60 an hour. By the end of the week, 40 hours, you, you're lucky if you bring home $65. Mm -hmm. Four kids. Yeah. So I did that for about a month. And then the guy told me about a job down in Revere Coffin and Brass. And I mean, it was a hard place to get into. But I knew somebody, so I I managed to get in there. And I was there for about a month, maybe. Uh, and then I found out they were going to close for two week vacation. But I couldn't get any uh, vacation pay yep. because I wasn't there long enough. Well, uh, anyway, I, what I did was I went down a dock and got a job on a boat. Yep. <laughs> so in them two weeks, I made more than those guys would have made in four months. Yep. You know? So I, I quit the Revere. I went back fishing. And that's where I stayed. And uh, let's see. Well, the people were fun, too, fishing. They Car what? All the characters you were working with. Oh my God! They had a. It's too bad I didn't bring a list of the names of some of the guys. There was, you know, they all had nicknames: Portland Bill, No Jersey Mike. Uh, there was a guy they called Hard to Port. He had a crooked neck. <laughs> so they called him Hard to Port, and then he had another name. Crooked Neck Leo. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, so, uh, do you want me to just keep going? Or? Yeah, you just. So anyway, anyway, I fished for a good number of years, and then I figured it's time enough for me to get the hell out of fishing. I uh, I got a job in Boston on a tugboat. Okay. So I was there for two years. We used to go up the Penobscot River with fuel, and we went to Searsport, Bucksport, and 
refuel all them places, and they had these big storage tanks. Down a canal, they got one, and uh, I was there for two years, and then it started to get real slack. So I, I said to the union guy, I said, Jesus Christ, I'm not making enough money here. I'm going to have to get the hell out of here. He said, you want to work down a steamship? I said, sure. So he got me a job down there. I was there for eight years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, man, what a job that was. Yeah. Oh. So there's nothing hard about that. All right, what else have I got here? How about your cooking on the fishing boats? The cooking? All your, right. Your, your famous cooking. Well... I never knew how to fry an egg, for God's sake. <laughs> but I heard this this guy uh, needed a cook on a dragon. That's when the price, I told you about the price of scallops. Yep. So he said, you want to go cook? I said, yeah. I said, I, I said, I've never been cook on a boat. But he said, don't worry about it. Do you want to get the hell out? He said, I'll help you along. Well, anyway, I had a smoked shoulder, and I didn't know what I fit. I put it in the oven, but you boil that in water. That's all you do. But after a while, I mean, the thing's not even half done. And as I went up to the skip, I said, Pete, I said, I don't know. We'll never be ready for supper. He said, well, don't worry about it. He, he says, uh. Let them go down and get a sandwich or something. So, when I look in the pan, the grease in there was that deep. All it was was, but it wasn't cooking very fast. Yep. But anyway, he helped me out. He was a hell of a nice guy. He was um, Gail Isaacson's brother, I think, or nephew. And he was a nice guy. We, when I was with him for a while, we left New Bedford, and it was blowing a gale of wind. So the skipper says, "Ah, we'll go into Newport." He said, "We'll leave there early in the morning." We get into Newport. He said, "Anybody got enough money for a movie or something?" Nobody had any money. He says, "All right." He says, "I'll." figure something out. So we had a, a butterfish net, probably from here to that wall over there. So he said, I'll see if anybody wants to buy it. So <laughs> he takes it around. He, he finally sold it. He got enough money for all of us to go to the movie that wanted to go. But that wasn't un unusual. Like a lot of times you'd go into Nantucket on a bad storm mm -hmm. instead of coming all the way back to New Bedford, sell a couple of bags of scallops, you know, to these restaurants, and uh, you'd have enough money if the guys would want to get up to drink. Yeah. So, I mean, there was drinking was like the drugs are today. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There wasn't many drugs around, but there was plenty of booze. All right, what else? I don't know if we got much else, uh, Morgan. Well, how how old are you now? Ninety two. Ninety two, almost ninety three, right? Yeah. I'm trying to think. So you must have been. You and I went fishing probably ten years ago. My grandfather and I. You remember that? Yeah. So, I'm like 12 or 13 at the time. It's my grandfather and it's you. We're out on the whaler. And, <laughs> man, all of a sudden you hit something with the reel and you're working it. And here's this 82-year-old guy reeling in this big fish. And I remember just watching you do this. And all of a sudden... Up alongside the boat, it's probably a two, two and a half or three foot long dogfish. Do you yeah, remember that? Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. They're tough to bring in. I was impressed. 
<laughs> them suckers. And, and then when you do get them and they curl around your arm with their tail. Yeah. Yeah, they were, they were hard fish to... So did you do a lot of recreational fishing? Yeah, kind of a lot. Me and a couple of guys, I, I had my own boat. And uh, I had a 25-foot cobia. Beautiful boat. But I mean, the engine always gave me trouble. Uh, but we used to go out and get two or three hundred pounds of scup, mm -hmm. and probably, and I had a commercial license, so we could sell them for, I don't know, sixty cents a pound or whatever. And uh, Then some of the guys went base golf, and I never went. Have you ever gone? No. No, you can get them right out here off Seaview. But, so anyway, I ended up being a pretty good cook. You figured it out. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I had no trouble getting a job to cook. Yeah. But most of the boats I was on, I was on eight years, 12 years, eight years. Oh. Yeah. What, back in the day when you guys would come in with a with a haul, what would you do with it? Would you just sell it right on the docks or would you process it? Well, what you would... went to the auction room. Okay. And then the dealers would bid on it. And, uh, well, you, you can go Is that the, aux the granite auction house? Yeah. Okay. Down on... Uh... The, it's, it's that cement one on Pier 3. Right. In fact, if you went in there, they, they got the chalkboard up there the way they used to bid. Yep. So that place would be mobbed at 7.30 in the morning. No kidding. And uh, Bill Eldridge, he was like the top buyer at that time. That auction didn't start until he showed up. Okay. But... Uh, he, when he came in, you could see things change right away. <laughs> and let's see, well, there was this Smitty, Ed Smith. He was another big buyer. Tishon was a big buyer. Well, there, there must have been a dozen of them. Okay. And uh, they would bid on your boat. So, at that time, if they bid like 12 cents, 15 cents, <laughs> which if you look at today's prices, it's a lot different. Yeah, yeah. But uh, sometimes the buyer would bid like, say, 20 cents a pound for your boy, which at that time was ridiculous. You'd go all the way down to his place. When he get there, he tries to cut you down to like 12 cents or 50. I can't take them fish. I oh, had so you, them sold, but the guy don't want them now. Or so, all kind of excuses. So you wouldn't get paid at the auction house? No. Uh, what happened was you'd get paid from the dealer. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> and I mean, them dealers were, the guys that were working there, they were stealing fish left and right. Yep. You know, as far as, and you're tallying enough out to fish, but you had to have eyes up the back of your head everywhere. But, but I remember one time one of the dealers, he said to the skipper, listen, if you, <coughs> I think it was Haddock, if you bring in a smaller Haddock, he says, I'll pay you for him. Yep. He says, you sure you're going to pay me? I'm not going to. Yeah, don't worry about it. So we get we get in. We had maybe forty, fifty thousand, and uh, we'd start taking all the fish out. But then the, the small haddock was separate. So all of a sudden he's taking them out. Everything's going along fine. All of a sudden he puts a few boxes of haddock off to the side. A little while later another few. So I'd say to Manny. What the hell is going on? What are you putting that fish over there for? He says, they're all uh, not rejects. Well, they were, he called them rejects. 
But <clears throat> I said, Jesus Christ, they came out of the same boat as the other fish. Yeah, yeah. He said, well, I don't care. He said, I, I'm responsible. They're rejects. So I went in the office. I said to Smitty, I said, Ed, what the hell's the story with these fish are putting them up? He said, well, what are you talking about? Let me have a let me go talk to Manny. So we get out there and uh, he talks to Manny. He says, well, that's right. They just don't make it. So they had a government inspector. Well, this, this Smitty he had a huge office and they used to make like chowder and everything. Mm -hmm. And they'd have whiskey in there where well, guys <laughs> want to drink. So that's where the inspector, government inspector, hung out. Yep. So I said, is there a government inspector here today? He said, yeah. I said, well, let's get him out of here. Let him decide if these are rejects. So Smitty says, you want to get him out here? He said, I got him right here. In my yeah. pocket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I, I, I said, how the hell would I call the skipper up and told him the story. He come down and I don't think we ever got paid a full price for them. So did you guys have any, uh, what were the regulations like in terms of amount of catch, what you could catch seasons? Did it's any like, of that exist back then? It's like anything else. If, regulations are made to be broken, I guess, because... At one time, we set a, a 10,000 pound limit mm -hmm. on skull. Well, a lot of the guys would bring in 10,000 pounds and they'd hide another 3,000 pounds, which they're doing that today. Yeah. But uh, like like on Dragon, you only allowed uh, alive 6,000 pounds a man. But I mean, like the guys used to say, well, we got six men, we got 36 pounds of yellowtail. But then they'd have another 15,000 pounds, but they'd call them flounders or lemon soles. They'd mislabel it. So, yeah, they just yeah. label it different, that's all. So, like I said, the guys never follow the bloody rules anyway. <laughs> like they told you, you should never have more than two toes of scallops on deck. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the guy used to keep, keep he'd round off the deck, cover up the hatches, mm. and everything else. Another incident we had, uh, I got on this boat. It was a dragon. We went lobster offshore mm -hmm. in them canyons, you know. And uh, at, we, we were the, one of the first draggers to tow for lobsters, or tow a net for lobsters. I didn't know anybody did that. Yeah, well, we that's what we did. We'd get as high as 30, 40 bushel of lobsters in one tow. Wow. But I mean, it, it was a long tow. It was probably about three hours. Okay. But out of them 30 bushel, you might get maybe 10 or 12 that you'd keep. The rest were eggers or Something was wrong with them and you didn't keep them. You got rid of them. But at that time, we got a, about 60, pound, 60 cents a pound for them to the deal. Well, one trip, we had about 25,000 pounds of lobsters aboard the boat. The way they did it was the pens that you kept all the fish in, well, they'd put the pen and they'd fill them up full of water, mm -hmm. half full. Okay. And that's where they kept the lobster. Well, anyway, this particular time, uh, we used to sell our, our lobsters down a canal to, to the guy that used to own Davy's Locker. Dog, he had a nickname, Doggy. Anyway, we were going to go in and sell our lobsters to him. Well, on the way home, the skipper heard that they could, if you sold them to Bay State up in Boston, they would give you a buck a pound. So he called them and they said, yeah, we'll take them and all that stuff. 
So we get there, and uh, we didn't even have the boat tied up. He said, forget about it. We don't want them. We got too many lobsters. I said, whatever excuse he had. <laughs> so now we're screwed. Doggy, or Davy's locker guy, he already hold, heard through the, through the uh, telephones or whatever that we were headed to Boston. Yeah. So now the skipper's in a panic. Well, we're going to have to go back to Doggy. So he calls up Doggy, and uh, Doggy says, you know what, I don't even want them lobsters. He says, so they're going back and forth. He says, the best I'll give you is 50 cents a pound. So we went down there and lucky. We were lucky to get rid of them. Mm. So Crystal Ice is obviously the, the ice supplier now. Was it Crystal Ice back then? Yeah. Well, what they used to do then was instead of the boats going over to Crystal Ice, yep. they had a mobile ice crusher. So they used to like tow that around the dock and they had these long hoses. Okay. And that's how they got the ice on the boat. But now it's a lot better and quicker to get over there with your boat. Yeah, now they just, they've got the hoses still? Yeah. It comes right out of the building. Yeah, yeah. Cr crushed. So they, it was a machine they would put on a boat or they'd put it on the docks? It had would, like four wheels on it. And they'd feed it blocks or? Yeah, they'd put the blocks in and crush them. And I mean, that was a tough job for the guy to run it because sometimes there was two or three boats abreast. Yeah. And he had to get them hoses over there. Even this at Crystal Ice, which I've done, when that ice is coming down that chute, you you know, you just put it over your shoulder and try try to guide it into the pin. But I mean, there's a hell of a lot of force there yeah, yeah. to knock it down. What else can we talk about? You tell me, you got all the stories. Well, I mean, a lot of times, you used to hear about these different guys got love affairs. Yep. And they're having all kind of problems at home. I remember this one guy, and uh, his nickname was Pinocchio. <laughs> which, if you saw him, you'd know why. But what a beak on him. But anyway, uh, every trip when we were going out, him and his wife, being a hell of a big fight. Yeah. You're already being cursing back and forth, back and forth. So this one particular trip did we're getting the skipper we're getting ready to leave. We're starting to let the lines go. She takes off her winter ring. Hey you bastard she throws it she throws it, <laughs> throws it in the water. So all these drama. All these yeah, drama. Yeah. yeah. What was it? There was another thing. Oh yeah. This one skipper I, I went with, Buddy Leach, a hell of a nice guy. And uh, like a lot of times offshore, when the weather was real bad, you, you just drift. Yeah. You're jogging up into the wind. and So Buddy, Buddy would call his wife, and she was a pistol, I'll tell you. Uh, so anyway, before you know it, she said, well, buddy, she said, I'm just taking a nice warm bath. Wish you were here. I'm going to put on my negligee. And, you know, <laughs> so we're all in the wheelhouse listening to it. So he's going, yeah, I know what you mean. I wish I was there. Well, anyway, when he hangs up, <coughs> uh, he said, Jesus Christ, buddy. She was ready for you. Too bad you weren't there and all that. And he's saying, yeah, yeah. He says, how come she is? She like that all the time? He says, yeah. They said, well, how come? He says, well, she just takes her pills. So the, this Pinocchio says, what kind of pills does she take? Carter's little liver pills. <laughs> he says, buddy, put a call in for me for my wife. <laughs> so, he, and I, I'm saying, we're jogging, you know what I mean? And all the guys in the wheelhouse. So Buddy gets on the phone, he calls up, and they're talking back and forth. And he said, 
Yeah, honey, he said, we'll be home in about three days. We're going to go on and on and on. He said, listen, before I get in, you go get yourself some Carter's Little Liver Pill. She said, what the hell do I want that for? Never mind. He said, just get them and keep taking them. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, the people you went out with, the, the, the crew, where were they from primarily? The local area or would well, people come from was, all over? They were kind of all over. There were some from the vineyard, some from Maine, some from New York. They'd be all over. And I, I never spent much time when we got ashore yep. with any of them. Because <coughs> a lot of them drank a lot. Ill behaved. You know? And. Yep. Uh, I wasn't going to be gone for eight or ten days and spend my freaking two days in a bar room with them. You know? Yeah, yeah. Now, nowadays we have boats coming up from like North Carolina and New yeah. Jersey because our, our fisheries yeah. are doing pretty well compared to a lot of places. Well, Did most you guys have boats from other places back then? Yeah, but not as many. Yep. The reason why you see a lot of other boats is most of them are from Virginia mm -hmm. or whatever, and it's closer to the fishing ground from here than it is from down there. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the reason why. And it, well, there's no union now. That's broke up. Yep. So. Where was the furthest you guys would would go up Nova Scotia or anything like that, or? Not that far. We went out at the northeast peak of George's Bay. That's about 250 miles, something yep. like that. How are the boats? Well, that's a good point. Compared to today. <laughs> well, this one boat I was on. Before, we went lo before I went lobstering, the skipper I went lobstering with, he had a boat in New Bedford here. The name of the boat was a flamingo. It was a wooden boat. And it was a high liner in its day. But when Felix, that was a skipper, when he had it, it was it was on its way out. So we're offshore mm -hmm. and it was rough as a sun of gun. We're fishing, we're going. And I'm laying in the bunk and I'm watching the the timbers up there. And like when she went down on the sea, it looked like they were coming up high. When they were back up, you know what I mean? I'm saying, Jesus Christ, I hope this thing makes it. But anyway, when I got on that other lobster boat, which he got, managed to get Skipper, it was a brand new steel boat oh, nice. from Newport. Bucalo, Crispina Bucalo. And uh, a lot of, I mean, you'd get out on shore when I first started fishing. You'd go out on a 55-foot, 60-foot boat. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, you're getting them heavy, big seas. It was kind of scary. Yeah. But, I mean, you don't give it that much thought when you're there. Compared to 65 cents an hour, whatever they're paying you. Uh, sure, dollar sixty-five. So, I remember one trip. Uh, it was a. We were gonna go out. We, it was our Christmas trip. We were gonna go out, and uh, the kids wanted me to. I didn't get a tree. I didn't have a car, so they said, "Dad, we want to get a tree." And uh, I said, "Well, I'll get it when we come in." So. I said, I'm going up, uh, so when we got down our dock, because of the weather report, the skipper called the, called the trip off. We'll go tomorrow. So when I came back home, you know, I told the kid, I said, you know what? We'll get the tree right now. But not having a car, we lived on Main Street, not too far from Route 6. So. I figured the bus comes around the corner, stops near the high school, goes all the way up to North Fairhaven. Yep. 
and there was a guy up there that sold Christmas trees. So I went and I stood there. The bus comes. I said, to her, and it was probably six or seven o'clock at night. I I said to the guy, I said, is there any chance that on your way back, I'm going to try to get a Christmas tree. Can I come in the back door? He, he said, yeah. Then what, he said, it's going to be slow anyway. So that's how I got the tree. <laughs> Threw it at Throw the back up, of the bus. Got, come back. They were happy as hell. Were any of the textile mills still open when you were a kid? They were probably on the way out. When you were a kid? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. When I was a kid, they were open. My grandfather, the old Pollock, they used to work like 6 to 2, 2 to 10. And the, all the foreigners, the Pollocks, they used to come to work early. Yep. You know, so they could yap, yap, yap. And uh, my uncle, he was working there. And them guys worked their ass off. But he said, you want to make some money? He says, you come with me today. So like they had, they'd have a break or something. He had a wagon with iron wheels on, and he maybe had two or three cases of soda. Mm -hmm. So what I would do, I'd pull a wagon, and he'd go around selling the soda. Whether they were on break or whatever, but yep. so that's one of the things we did. But there was a warm set of mill. There was a lot of mills in operation when I was real young, but then they all moved south. That was like the kind of like the fifties, right? Forties, fifties. They yeah. started moving. Yeah. yeah. So they were around for a while. Yep. So your your grandfather was. First generation American, or no, he was from Poland. So he came over from Poland. Yeah. Your grandfather. Yeah. Okay. So you were third, second generation. Yeah. Any life advice? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I was always, I wasn't a, a big guy, but I was always a hard worker. Yeah. And that's one thing I, I instilled on my family especially the boys, you got to work. You can't sit around watching TV. Right. <clears throat> well, when Tom and John were young, I used to tell them on Saturdays, I want one hour out of you guys. Mm -hmm. After that, go and come as you please. So their friends used to come and lay on the lawn waiting for them to, to get done. And they did their job. They did a lot of things that even John tells me today. He says, Jared don't know how to do shit. He says he can't get out of his own way. <laughs> you know? But anyway, I instilled that work ethic right. in him, which was good because all my grandkids are good workers. Yep. Except, no, not all of them. One of them is not, definitely. But the rest are like Brett. Yeah, he can work, huh? Have you seen his play? I haven't been over there yet, yeah. He got a nice play. You gotta get over there, go for a swim. What a what a spread he's got there. But he works his tail off. Yep. He said I was down there the other day, I took a ride. Sixty four hours he put in. Now D W White, is it D W? Yep. What a business that guy's got. Yep. He's all over the place. Oh, it's a big company. They're yeah. all over Massachusetts. Uh, now they're, uh, they got a contract to do these train stations, depots. So they, they, they took down a building there on Church Street. Oh, they're doing that here in New Bedford. Yeah. I didn't know they were doing that job, yeah. Yeah, they, they got... You no know, Bedford, Fall River, Taunton. So they f just finished that one in New Bedford, knocking it down. Mm -hmm. It was an, uh, another empty building. But Brett was telling me 
that the big chunks of concrete, they got machines that, you know them Z bars or J bars or, you know when you're putting cement down, you put down these iron rods. Oh, uh, the rebar. Rebar. Yeah. So, he said they got a machine that takes that out of the cement. No kidding. And he, 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 he uh, takes all the metal they get and he sells it. Scrap it, yeah. Oh, he's a hell of a businessman. <laughs> but Brett was telling me the other day, he says, when, when uh, White isn't there, he puts me in charge. Mm -hmm. So that sounds good for him. Yeah. But he was always a good worker, Brett. Well, this was fun. Huh? This was fun. Thank you. Well, I mean, I hope I helped you out in some way. I think it's just fun to hear the history and... Yeah. Get it recorded so we can share it with other people and... Yep. Yeah, well, I hope I don't sound foolish on here. No, no.